Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Breakfast at UM Health. Uh, I'm Jaya from the Endocrine Unit, Department of Medicine, uh, and I'm happy to moderate and chair this morning's session. Um, the fact that we have moved on from calling COVID-19 a pandemic to an endemic simply means that this nasty virus is going to be here to stay for some time. So despite the fact that we've had to deal with it in the last three years, um, still, although we know quite a bit about its effects on the human body and how it actually affects the respiratory system, some of its effects on the other systems, including the endocrine uh, system, is, is largely unknown. Um, and there's, in the recent past, there's been increasing interest with regards to the effects of this COVID-19 virus on the thyroid gland. So to take us through that this morning, we are very fortunate to have, I'm, and I'm happy to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Shamila Sunita Paramasivam. She's a senior consultant endocrinologist with our unit. Um, she did her undergraduate degree at Unimas and then went on to do an MRCP and an advanced training in endocrinology with the Ministry of Health. She has a special interest with regards to thyroid gland, um, and I think she's best fitted to take us through what the effects of COVID-19 is on the thyroid gland. Shamila, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much, Jaya, for the kind introduction, and good morning, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> so th thanks very much, Jaya, for the kind introduction, and a very good morning, everyone. Welcome to the breakfast at uh, UM Health today. So as what Jaya has alluded to us today, um, COVID-19 has been around, we've, we've, we've been hearing about it in the last three, almost three years. And um, what we know most about it is the pulmonary effects. And yeah, some known extra pulmonary uh, manifestations such as a thromboembolic uh, events, you know, um, the cardiac events, things like that. But what's, uh, what's beginning to emerge now are the abnormalities that are being seen in the endocrine system. Yeah. Um, so today, today I'm going to particularly talk about the thyroid gland. <clears throat> And uh, so I'll take you through the outline of my talk. Uh, what, so what, what, what we're going to go through very briefly is talk about the SARS-CoV pathophysiology, which I'm sure you all know already, but we're just going to briefly go through it. We're going to look at the effect of SARS-CoV infection on the thyroid itself. Yeah. And then we're going to go through the reported thyroid abnormalities, a spectrum of the abnormalities that has been seen uh, in uh, SARS-CoV infection. And then lastly, we're going to look at does the thyroid itself, the effect of the, any abnormality on the thyroid, does it affect uh, SARS-CoV infection? Okay, and lastly, if we have some time, we, I have got two uh, brief cases that I would like to share with you. Okay, so without further ado, let's go on to the, to the crux of the matter. Um, so this is, this is our, our COVID uh, uh, virus, which has been you know, wrecking chaos in the last three years. So these are the numbers from as of uh, the 25th uh, yesterday. So total cases worldwide, many numbers there, 600 over a million. Uh, deaths, about 6.5 million. Uh, in looking in a local perspective, Malaysia, uh, as of yesterday, we have about almost 5 million cases with 36,000 uh, over deaths. Yeah, so of course, as you can see, definitely compared to, you know, with the Delta, uh, compared to the Delta wave, um, deaths and hospitalization has definitely dropped. However, we, you know, all these new extra pulmonary manifestations are being seen as more and more pe uh, people get affected by the virus. Yeah. Okay. So what's the pathophysiology of SARS-CoV, of, of your COVID infection? How does it enter your cells? So I think this is all, this is, this has been well established that the SARS-CoV enters through the ACE2 receptor uh, together with this tmpr ss 2 uh, receptor. So what happens is that these receptors allow the the the, the spikes pro, the spike protein on the on the virus allows it to go into the cells. Okay, and what has been postulated? These are the postulations of how it actually affects us. Huh? Number one is a direct cytotoxic effect. Okay, there is a vi the virus itself attacks the cells. The other one is a dysregulation of the red renin uh, angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay, <clears throat> which then results in inflammation tissue injury, and then the, the virus causes endothelial cell damage, okay, and thromboinflammation, which is why uh, COVID infection is also associated with thromboembolic events, huh? things like pulmonary embolism and, and things like that, okay, and the last uh, postulated pathophysiology is a dysregulated immune response, okay, so, uh, you know, especially those who come in very ill, CAT4, CAT5, where they have the cytokine release syndrome, where there's release of uh, interleukins, huh? your TNF alpha, which results in a, a hyper, hyper immune uh, response, yeah? Okay, so 
So we do know that the ACE, uh, ACE2 and, uh, receptors, as well as the transmembrane protease serine 2 or the TMPRSS2 receptors are involved in your SARS-CoV internalization into the, whole, into the host cells. Okay, so where does the thyroid fall in place here? So what's interesting to note is that um, there are many other organs uh, in the body that show high levels of this ACE2 expression, your kidney, your, your, your intestines, your heart. And you can see here that the thyroid is also one of those organs. Yeah, it's got very high levels of the ACE2 expression, which, is, which has been postulated. Perhaps that's why the thyroid gland has been easily sort of uh, uh, targeted by this SARS-CoV. Okay, so lower levels have been seen in the brain, skin, pituitary, skeletal muscles. So, this, so that's why they, it's postulated that, that because the thyroid follicular cells express this ACE2, it leaves it susceptible to, to SARS-CoV injury. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is looking at a paper uh, about six to eight months into the pandemic in July 2020. Um, and you can see that at that time, it was already noted that there were many other organs, uh, extra manifestations that were already noted. The brain, yeah, it caused a lot of headaches, dizziness, and cephalopathy. The kidney, the liver, the gastrointestinal tract, thromboembolism, yeah, that was that was being recognized. Uh, patients having PE, yeah, which I think we've all seen when we do our COVID rotations, uh, cardiac, yeah. So at that time, what was noted from the endocrine uh, uh, system was actually mostly related to to diabetes, to 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 sugar. Yeah, so you can see what was reported at the time was hyperglycemia, diabetic ketoacidosis. And this was perhaps because of uh, steroids that were being used. Yeah? Um, and also it unmasked a lot of people who had prediabetes or people who, um, you know, who had diabetes that were not diagnosed. And it, it, the, the, the disease itself, as well as the steroids, unmasked that. Yeah? So at that time, this was early, about six to eight months into the pandemic, there was no mention about any other endocrine um, manifestation of uh, COVID-19. However, a short two years later, yeah, you can see that COVID has not spared any of the endocrine organs, in fact. Yeah? So there have been case reports uh, reporting abnormalities seen in most of the endocrine organs in the pituitary gland, where hypopit has been seen, yeah? in the adrenal glands, adrenal insufficiency, even the, high, even the parathyroids, where hypoparathyroidism has been reported. Yeah? And of course, the pancreas, yeah, which we know, um, and even the gonads, yeah, it's, it's resulted in alkytes, in low testosterone, okay? And of course, last, uh, this, this topic is talking about thyroid. So the, it caused a whole spectrum of thyroid abnormalities, okay? So these were all the manifestations that were seen in just two years, yeah? <clears throat> so let's focus on the thyroid. Okay, so the question is, how does it actually affect the thyroid gland, yeah? Um, so there, there, are two, there are two mechanisms in, in, how, in which the uh, COVID-19 affects your thyroid gland. So number one is direct infection by the virus. So this is, this is seen with other viruses as well, influenza, CMV, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, um, you know, adenovirus, where the vi when, you know, people who have uh, upper respiratory tract infections and sub uh, subsequently develop pain in the neck, fever. Yeah, so this is direct infection by the virus. So that's one of the postulations of how uh, COVID-19 can affect the thyroid gland. The other way is that because of this hyperimmune response that uh, COVID does, uh, it results in an abnormal immune response and the cytokine storm. This, all these uh, antibodies actually result in inflammation, uh, and especially all your interleukins and things like that, cause uh, destruction of your thyroid gland. Yeah. So what are the spectrum that's been seen? So thyrotoxicosis is definitely one, yeah, where uh, patients present with symptoms of thyrotoxicosis, not just thyrotoxicosis, hypothyroidism has also been reported, yeah. And on top of that, uh, not thyroidal illness. So this is actually the, uh, well, the sort of the name of what used to call sick thyroid syndrome, if you're familiar with that. Okay, this is usually seen in patients who are quite sick, uh, where you get this abnormality of the thyroid function uh, uh, results, yeah. So now let's look at Thyrotoxicosis, okay, which means high thyroid levels, sir. Uh, um, and these are these are the the types of thyrotoxicosis, uh, the causes of thyrotoxicosis that have been reported in the literature in the last you know two and a half years or so. So the first one is subacute thyroiditis. I'll take you through each of this: subacute thyroiditis, painless thyroiditis, as well as Graves' disease. Okay. <clears throat> So let's look at subacute thyroiditis. This is this has been mostly reported, yeah, uh, in COVID nineteen. 
uh, uh, SAT, yeah, subacute thyroiditis. So the first case was actually reported somewhere in July 2020, about that, that sort of six, seven months post uh, the start of the pandemic. This was reported in, in Italy. If you remember, Italy was one of the um, sort of the hot spots at that time uh, where a lot of patients were getting uh, infected and, uh, and becoming very ill. So this was the first report, an 18-year-old girl who presented with neck pain um, and, and hyperthyroidism, yeah, uh, and and subsequently, uh, about a, a month later, in August 2020, this was reported. Subacute thyroiditis was reported closer to our shores in Singapore. Okay, similar presentation uh, with neck pain and uh, hyperthyroid symptoms. Yeah, after a COVID infection, and then subsequently, uh, there were many other reports uh, of similar findings. Yeah, of uh, subacute thyroiditis that was seen post COVID. Okay, so this is this is a systematic review uh, that looked at the, the uh, uh, cases of subacute thyroiditis, the case reports, yeah, and uh, sort of uh, 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 did a review on on an evidence based uh, review on all these uh, reports lah. So there were twenty seven cases, and what they found is, as with most thyroid diseases, it's more often found in women, and these were seen mostly with mild COVID infection, you know. So um, your your cat ones, your cat twos. Yeah, so they were, they were patients who were well, they were quarantined at home, they were fine, and then subsequently developed this subacute thyroiditis. Yeah, so the manifestation, when did it actually occur? So it's a, it, it, it can occur even during the COVID infection, so about three days, which means during the period of the COVID infection, or up to two months after you've actually had COVID. Yeah, and uh, the classical symptoms would be neck pain. Yeah, sometimes patients um, may not actually. Uh, uh, complain of neck pain. They might say they have this persistent sore throat, sore throat, you know. But actually, when you look at it, uh, when you when you take the further history and you examine, it's actually pain and tenderness in the anterior part of the neck, yeah, with fever and hyperthyroid symptoms. And also, you must you must take into, into account sometimes some of these patients may be on steroids, you know, if they if, uh, and that can actually uh, sort of um, reduce the, the pain that they have. <clears throat> okay, so what uh, biochemical findings do you find? is that typically they will have a high T4 and T3 as seen uh, with uh, hypothyroidism, uh, thyrotoxicosis, and also their inflammatory markers, DSR, CRP will be raised, okay? And when you do an ultrasound neck, uh, looking at, especially with uh, a Doppler, uh, where you look at the blood flow in the neck, you'll find patchy hypoechogenic areas with reduced vascularity. Okay, so this is typical of your uh, destructive type of thyroiditis, yeah? Where uh, you have reduced vascularity, due to the destruction, okay? So when so what's interesting is that when you when you look at the antibodies, all the antibodies are negative. So this is purely an, in, an infectious cause, okay? Um, and the most common steer, uh, treatment that was given in all these uh, case reports was actually steroids. Because of the pain that they had, they were given steroids, okay? And in most cases, uh, they, they had complete resolution and new thyroidism. There were one or two cases where they did develop hypothyroidism uh, uh, subsequently, but in most of the cases, it was completely resolved, yeah? Just as per a usual thyroiditis that's caused by either vi uh, other viruses as well. Okay, so what's interesting about subacute thyroiditis post-COVID is that it's seen in mild COVID-19 uh, uh, infection, your cat ones, cat twos, and, um, what, how it actually affects the thyroid gland is that it is a direct infection uh, by the SARS-CoV virus, okay? So to summarize, these are the typical findings that you will get, neck pain, you will get raised inflammatory markers, okay? Your white cell count will be raised, CRP, ESI will be raised, and your thyroid antibodies will be negative, okay? So it's not an autoimmune process, yeah? So it's not Hashimoto. So if you get somebody with very high thyroid antibodies, then this could be an autoimmune process, but in these cases, it's caused by the virus, so it's, the antibodies are actually negative. Okay, so now we move on to the second, um, the second type of thyroiditis that has been reported with COVID-19. Okay, the painless thyroiditis. So this is a bit different uh, compared to your subacute thyroiditis. So um, this, is a, is, this is thyrotoxicosis that is discovered without neck pain. So most of the time, patients don't complain of anything. They're actually admitted because of COVID-19. Yeah, so they are a bit, they are, these are the patients who are a bit more ill, they are CAT3 and above. And it's usually detected from a blood test or because they're persistently tachycardic and somebody sends off a thyroid function, yeah? Again, this is a destructive thyroiditis 
where your antibodies are negative, yeah, um, and it's a bit different compared to the, the direct virus uh, uh, infection, where it is inflammatory mediated. So it's not caused by the virus itself; it's caused by the all the inflammatory markers. You know, your your interleukin six in particular. Yeah. So when you have very high, when a patient is very sick. They have very they have, they have higher levels of interleukin six, and what happens is that there's an inverse relationship. So the higher your interleukin six levels are, the lower your TSH, right? Because of this, this inflammation actually goes and dis, it destroys the thyroid gland, right? And these painless thyroiditis are usually seen in hospitalized patients. Okay, so uh, this was discovered during uh, a study. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, a study in Austria uh, in uh, in Italy, yeah, where. Uh, again, during the time when we were having um, a lot of cases, so uh, this this Tarakov study, where the uh, patients who were being admitted to their hospital, yeah, those hospitalization hospitalized COVID patients, uh, were uh, a TSH was sent for all these patients, yeah, it was part of their sort of package, you know, they they did it for all the patients, and 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 any patient who had an abnormal TSH either low or high, they would then send off the T3, T4, and the antibodies if necessary. So what they found is that. In these patients who were hospitalized, hospitalized with COVID-19, almost 20% of them had thyrotoxicosis in the absence of neck pain, okay? So this, uh, this uh, explains to us about the, this phenomenon of this painless thyroiditis, yeah? And, um, uh, and, and this, uh, these patients, because they were much, Ill, uh, much more ill as well, uh, what they found, they, so they look at the relationship of your TSH, your T4 with the patient's outcomes. And they found that those with this overt thyrotoxicosis were actually associated with higher risk of uh, AF, uh, atrial fibrillation, thromboembolic events, as well as in-hospital mortality and longer hospitalization. So these patients were more ill and the thyrotoxicosis didn't help. Lah, yeah? And um, in terms of the thyrotoxicosis, most had spontaneous recovery with not, uh, without requiring uh, antithyroid drugs. So this is uh, expected because Destructive thyroiditis, you don't need to treat with antithyroid uh, drugs. It's because it's, it's a release of your thyroid hormones, yeah? So most of these patients had spontaneous recovery without um, uh, antithyroid drugs or without steroids. <clears throat> okay, so that's the second uh, um, type of thyroid abnormality that's been reported, yeah? So now we go on to the next one, which is Graves' disease, okay, which is interesting because, you know, um, you, you don't think that COVID would actually cause Graves, but in fact, it has been reported. Yeah, that uh, uh, patients who've had COVID actually develop Graves' disease or those who've had Graves' disease before actually develop relapses. Yeah, so this is a report uh, in 2021 where it's shown that um, SARS-CoV is another one of the causes of relapse in Graves' disease. So perhaps, you know, when, we, when, when the medical textbooks are uh, uh, altered in the future, we have to add SARS-CoV as one of the causes for relapse. Yeah, so what has been found in the reports is that uh, this is looking at five patients. Uh, again, of course, with Graves' disease, mostly the preponderance is mostly female, uh, and the age between the uh, the age ages age range of twenty to about sixty years old. Okay, and Grace, the, the thing about the 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 occurrence of Graves' disease is a bit later. It doesn't occur during the COVID infection. It occurs later, about one to two months uh, post COVID. Yeah, um, and. Three in five actually have a history of Graves and they were in remission for many years. So they were actually very well in remission, no relapses. However, having COVID uh, caused them to have a relapse. Yeah, And the balance two patients actually did not have Graves at all and they developed new onset Graves disease. Okay, So the findings are very typical, low TSH and high T4, T3. Okay? So uh, in contrast to the other two conditions, if you remember, these patients have got positive antibodies. Huh? They are trapped, which is the antibody that is uh, responsible for Graves' disease, your, your TSH receptor antibodies, which goes and stimulates the thyroid gland, producing the thyroid hormones. They are, it's positive. Yeah? And, and uh, of course, some patients, uh, if you don't have trapped, some patients had a, a positive anti-TPO and anti-TG. So what about the thyroid uptake? Okay, so if you remember in the last two, the thyroid uptake was actually reduced because it's a destructive type of uh, thyroiditis. However, in Graves' disease, it's different. The, th the thyroid gland is actually uh, hyper, okay? It's actually producing excess hormones. So the uptake is actually increased, yeah? The ultrasound shows hypervascularity of the thyroid parenchyma, okay? And all these patients, what was interesting is that all these patients um, required higher doses of metimazole that, compared to what you normally use in Graves' disease for a longer period of time, okay? So for Graves, you normally give a high dose and then you taper it down. But these patients re required a higher dose of metimazole up to two, three months, yeah? So it was like a more resistant type of Graves' disease. 
Okay. However, they did uh, achieve a uh, euthyroidism, and then they were, you know, their their uh, methimazole doses were then tapered down. Okay. So how does this uh, uh, how does Graves' disease form post COVID? Um, so basically, the virus attacks your thyroid gland, and that results in all this autoimmune uh, process. And on top of that, autoimmunity for Graves' disease also gets produced. Okay. And that results in Graves' disease. Yeah. So COVID-19 could be a trigger for a new case or relapse of Graves' disease. The patients are trapped positive, yeah, and the treatment is, is with antithyroid drugs. So different from the other two, yeah. Okay, so now we've talked about thyrotoxicosis. So interestingly, COVID can also cause hypothyroidism, yeah. Okay, so how does that happen? So, so it's been reported in a case report. Uh, this was in Singapore in 2021 in May, where they found a patient who had Hashimoto's thyroiditis with overt hypothyroidism that occurred seven days after resolution of mild COVID. So this patient had normal thyroid function and then subsequently developed hypothyroidism. Okay, and in this patient, their antibody levels were very high. Okay, their anti-TPO levels were very, very high, more than 2,000. Okay, so in the same study, if you remember, uh, the Tarakov study in, in Italy, where they, they looked at all these ill patients who were admitted with, uh, with, uh, with uh, COVID, uh, and their TSH. So you remember 20% of them had hyperthyroidism, yeah? Um, and they found that about 5.2%, about 15 of these 200 over patients had actually hypothyroidism, all right? A majority of them was actually subclinical, yeah? Uh, where the T4 was normal, but the TSH was high, yeah? And, uh, and, and what they found was that patients who had overt hypothyroidism, it can actually negatively impact the outcome of COVID-19. So it was actually associated with increased mortality. Yeah. So whether your, your thyroid is high or thyroid is low during the time when the patient is ill with COVID, it doesn't help the patient. Lah, yeah. It is associated with an increased mortality. Okay. So the hypothyroidism in these patients, um, most of them actually persisted after discharge. There were, I think, one or two that actually uh, resolved, but majority of them actually persisted after discharge because of the destruction of the gland. <clears throat> okay, so the third, the third way that, that, that COVID can actually affect the thyroid gland is actually this um, uh, situation called non-thyroidal illness, yeah? So what is non-thyroidal illness? It's, it's where you have uh, uh, abnormality in your thyroid function gland seen in ill patients. So this is very common, huh? it can be caused by any, any kind of illness, whether it's, either, either, whether it's sepsis or post-surgery or you know, post-MI, any kind of illness, can result in this non-thyroid illness where you know the thyroid, the, your thyroid levels drop. It's sort of a con, it's a conservation kind of a, of a response of the body. Yeah. So what you see is that you will get a low. What's significant is you will get a, a low T3. Okay, low T3, a low or normal TSH, and a low or normal T4. All right. So what they found is that there's a positive correlation between the severity of COVID-19 and these low TSH, uh, low T3 levels, which means that the yeah, that means the most severe the COVID was, the most severe their non-thyroidal illness was, which is, which is expected, isn't it? Yeah. So what was found is that when these patients require any treatment uh, with non-thyroidal illness, it's not standard that you actually treat this because it's, it's a response of the body. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, what they found is that patients who had COVID-19 pneumonia yeah, had lower mean TSH-T3 values versus uh, uh, those who did not have uh, pneumonia, yeah? Okay, so the effect, I mean, it, it, they, so the, the, what is postulated is that it's a non-thyroid illness or could this be the SARS-CoV actually affecting the pituitary gland, yeah? So that sort of remains to be, to be, dis, uh, to be known, lah, yeah? And another thing is you need to take into, into account in all these sick patients who have pneumonia, um, you know, CAT4 and above, uh, they will be receiving... And glucocorticoids itself can actually decrease your TSH levels, okay? So the next question we ask ourselves, does the thyroid dysfunction actually affect the prognosis of COVID-19, yeah? So the answer is yes, yeah? So in patients who had overt thyrotoxicosis, 32% uh, developed AF, 16% developed thromboembolism. So they had higher risk of complications, yeah? And with higher in-hospital mortality, yeah? With longer hospital duration, uh, hosp hospitalization, yeah? Okay, and there's a relationship between the severity of the systemic inflammatory markers, like your interleukin-6 with the hyperthyroidism, yeah? So the higher your interleukin-6 are, the more severe your, your thyroid dysfunction would be, okay? 
arrhythmias, hemodynamic instability, myocardial ischemia. Okay, but it's important to understand that those patients who have graze, just, just, just because you have graze doesn't mean that you're more at risk of developing, of contracting the disease. Okay, your risk of contracting is same as anybody else, but you are at higher risk of the complications. Okay, so this is just a, a chart from that, uh, from that uh, uh, Italian uh, paper looking at the TSH ranges. And these were, these were the in-hospital mortality rates uh, in uh, this COVID-19 patients, which was stratified for their serum TSH. And you can see that the one in the star here, uh, the, the, the shortest bar here, this is basically those patients who had TSH in the normal range. So you can see their mortality was actually the lowest. Whereas those who had abnormal TSH, whether TSH was low or TSH was high, which means whether they were hypothyroid or hypothyroid, they actually had higher uh, in-hospital mortality rates. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so now I think I have maybe a few minutes to go through uh, just two very quick cases. Um, so these are patients that we have seen in our clinics. Yeah, We're seeing more and more these days with regards to COVID-related thyroid abnormalities. So this is a 69-year-old female. Uh, she's got the regular diabetes, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, all very well controlled. She has a history of a small MNG, which was detected from a health screening. They did an ultrasound. They found some nodules. It's non-toxic, no obstructive symptoms. She's, there's no, no uh, intervention for that. Okay, so she presents uh, uh, with palpitations for five days. Okay, and she complains of this sore throat, this persistent sore throat that doesn't go away. Um, and she says there's no neck pain, it's more like a sore throat. All right, she doesn't have any tremors, there's no heat intolerance, she's, but she's lost about one kilo over the last two weeks. And this is a lady who doesn't lose weight and suddenly she's lost about one kilo. And she gives a significant history of having uh, cat 2 COVID about 16 days ago. She was quarantined at home was fairly unremarkable and she was well to that. Okay, and there's no family history of thyroid disease. Okay, so on examination, she's actually underweight. She's a very small sized lady. Um, she's comfortable, she's not agitated. She looks very well, okay. Um, there's no neck tenderness actually when you feel. Uh, there's this very small mountain nodular goiter which has been there same size over the last, what, 10 years or so. No exophthalmus to tell us whether this is uh, Graves disease, okay. and. Uh, other than a heart rate of about 110, she's got no other signs of thyrotoxicosis. Okay, so these are her blood results. So she's got an elevated T4, T3 and a suppressed TSH. So this is uh, thyrotoxicosis. Okay, so at that time, um, you know, what was going through, through our minds was that could this be a toxic MNG? Could this be a post COVID? So, because we, you know, you must understand that thyroid antibodies, you know, your uptake scan, you can't do it straight away. Yeah. And the results for your thyroid antibodies don't come out straight away. So, we started the patient on carbimazole and some beta blockers at that time. Okay. <clears throat> and looking at that, so we, we, see, we saw the patient fairly early in two weeks huh, to, to, to look at the, at the, the uh, projection of the, of the thyroid function. Well, it was found that. The T4 dropped very much, yeah, from 31 to 17, and the T3 actually from 11 to 5, just two weeks. Okay, so at that time, the carbamazole dose was actually reduced. Okay, and you can see in just four weeks, the T4 actually, T3 actually normalized, and the TSH is also normalized, you know, in just four weeks. So at that point, her antibodies have come back and they're actually undetectable. Okay, this is your TSI. So uh, it's, it's, it's a trap antibody, but it's looking at the stimulating uh, uh, immunoglobulin, which is available in UMMC. And it's, it was undetectable. So she's got no thyroid antibodies, yeah? And we managed to do a technician uptake scan of the thyroid gland. And there's actually reduced uptake in bilateral uh, uh, thyroid lobes. So this is a destructive type of thyroiditis, okay? So then the thyroid uh, was then stopped. And lo and behold, in 10 weeks, her TFT was actually normal, yeah? So, at the, so the, the thing is, the diagnosis is a little bit iffy here. Is it a subacute thyroiditis? Is it a painless thyroiditis? So if you remember what has been reported, Subacute is usually painful, yeah? And in painless thyroiditis, they're usually in patients who are more ill. This was a lady who just had CAT2. She was, she was actually relatively quite well, yeah? But, um, you know, there's, not, there's nothing, uh, there's no 100% in medicine and there have been reports of subacute thyroiditis not having any pain, yeah? Okay, so case two is a 40-year-old female uh, with a history of Graves' disease 10 years ago in remission, totally well. Um, she developed cat, uh, COVID CAT2 in May this year, and then she presents a few months later with thyrotoxic symptoms. Okay, first remission in 10 years. Okay, no neck pain. So clinically, she is definitely hyperthyroid. Uh, she's got exothermus in the right eye. Yeah. 
Um, so these are her, her levels. You can see a T4, T3 is very elevated. So this is very clear cut Graves disease, uh, uh, Graves disease relapse. So she was started on carbimazole, on propanolol. And you can see at four weeks, the T4 comes down, but not at a level that we usually, you know, we usually see quite a good response, but she seemed to require longer duration of uh, carbimazole in order to get her to a level. So she was very much symptomatic in these eight weeks. Yeah. Um, and only after that, you know, after she's been treated for about two months to three months, that's when she started to feel better. Okay, so her TSI, the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin was very high, 10. So this is just a clear cut uh, relapse graze that was triggered by a COVID-19, which I think we're going to probably be seeing more and more of. Yeah. Okay, so in summary, um, COVID-19 has an effect on the thyroid, which is direct yeah, or indirect, which is uh, immune mediated. So all forms of thyroid abnormalities have been reported, whether thyroid toxicosis, hypothyroidism, and non-thyroidal illness. And um, the, in terms of high thyroid toxicosis, yeah, COVID-induced thyroid toxicosis, what has been reported has been subacute thyroiditis, painless thyroiditis, and Graves' disease. Okay, And low TSH, low T3 in thyroid toxicosis appears to be predictors of poor outcomes in patients who are hospital, hospitalized with the COVID-19. So the question remains is, should we be doing TFTs in all our patients? So I think it's a bit premature for that. Uh, we need more data because it needs to be a cost-effective uh, recommendation. Yeah, so of course, if somebody has symptoms, you know, persistent tachycardia, uh, you ruled out PE, then yes, you should do a thyroid function, but not in every patient at this stage. Yeah, so watch this space. There's more to come because there's going to be more data out with regards to um, thyroid disease. So thank you very much. And with that, I will pass the floor back to Jia. <clears throat> thank you very much, Shamila. That was a very comprehensive overview of uh, how the COVID-19 affects our thyroid gland. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be more. Uh, we'll learn more in the in the near future. So uh, there's a question in the chat box, Shamila, with regards to, I, I know you've told us how it can affect, you can have thyrotoxicosis, and on the other hand, you can have hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question, and I know you kind of touched on it a little bit about, you know, who would need screening? Uh, because we do see patients in our post-COVID clinics, or, or, you know, you might have, you, you know, even our regular patients who come to our clinics would have said to us mm -hmm. that, you know, I had COVID last month. Um, and if it's our patient with Graves' disease, do you check a thyroid function at that point if she's asymptomatic or what would you do? So I think at this point, there, is, there are actually no clear recommendations because these are all, you must understand the data that's coming out is all actually based on case reports. So it's actually just reports of all these new uh, thyroid abnormalities that are being seen. But I think we need to be pragmatic about it. So we cannot be sending TFTs in every patient. You know, I think definitely if a patient is symptomatic, then you, ha you have to check the thyroid function. But if a patient is asymptomatic clinically well, I don't think there's a need to actually check. But, um, you know, in patients who are high risk, for example, they, you know, uh, multiple relapse, Graves disease, multiple relapse, you know, and, and then, then you may want to consider, may, maybe, maybe you might want to send. How, however, I think you have to go clinically. You have to look at the patient clinically. Uh, symptomatic, definitely you treat. Uh, definitely you set, you, you investigate, but definitely not for every patient. Otherwise, you'll be, I mean, we've had, we have like, you know, how many thousands of uh, of COVID infections, we'll be sending TFTs for all these patients, which is not right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, along that same lines, do we have any like number? I mean, from large database studies with regards to the prevalence or incidence of this this thyroid conditions. Yeah. So we don't have no, we don't have a big number. So it, I think the if I uh, if you remember the paper that the Italian paper, that's the, the one that had probably yeah the thy the thyroid paper. That's the one that had probably slightly more. You know, they, they because they looked at all the patients who were, who were hospital, hospitalized. So, but then this, this is a different cohort of patients. You know, these are ill patients. You know, we don't actually have the numbers at the moment because they're all based on case reports. So I think it, I mean, we probably will, will get all these data in, in you know, years to come lah, as we see more and more patients and more randomized control trials are being done. But at the moment, no. So in the thyroid study, they looked at the more ill patients and they found 20% of these patients had, had thyroid toxicosis. Uh, and 5% had hypothyroidism. But these were sick patients who were admitted with COVID, you know, and did not, they did not actually have symptoms of thyroid toxicity. It was just picked up from the TSH because I think, you know, it was a, probably a, an academic center and they did it for all their, their, their thyroid patients, uh, sorry, their, their COVID patients. Shamila, for these subacute uh, forms, uh, thyroiditis, would you, yep. I mean, when, because they, they can, I mean, they, you have clearly showed us that it can lead to adverse outcomes, increased yep. mortality, um, I mean, I mean, for the anesthetic colleagues, uh, for the ID physicians, respiratory physicians, when do we need to jump on it uh, in terms of treatment? 
I mean, do we need to immediately treat? Because some of it we know all recovers and resolves, but um, yeah. when do we decide on treatment? So, of course, if you see that the patient is symptomatic, Okay, if a patient is who is symptomatic, tachycardic, you know, has got all the symptoms, you definitely have to, it, it depends, okay? So if it's subacute, when it's painful, you have to treat with steroids, okay? Because it, it's a very painful, debilitating uh, condition, yeah? But in painless thyroiditis, that's a bit different. So what you need, you don't, you don't give antithyroid drugs because this is a destructive thyroiditis, but you can protect the heart by giving beta blockers, yeah? Uh, to reduce the effect of the, thyro the, the, the hyperthyroidism on the heart. So definitely, definitely, if, if the patient is very well, there's no tachycardia, you don't actually have to treat, you just monitor. But if patient is having symptoms, patient is you know, very tachycardic, you've ruled out other causes, uh, then you, you don't treat with antithyroid drugs, you treat with beta blockers. However, you need to be, you need to be sure that you're not dealing with Graves. Lah. So if you have somebody who is uh, at risk of Graves, you know, has history of Graves before, or family history of, uh, of, of Graves, then, uh, sometimes you might need to treat with antithyroid drugs first and then monitor because you won't get the antibodies uh, straight away. You know, your, 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 you won't get your results straight away. So sometimes, like, for example, if you remember the first case that I presented to you, we treated her with carbimazole because we were not sure, was this a, a toxic MNG at that point? You know, um, so it, it's okay to always, you know, err on the side of caution, but the key is to monitor closely. Uh, because yeah. if you if you don't give the carbamazole and then you don't see the patient in four to six weeks, a lot of a lot of things could have happened with the thyroid uh, function at that point. Yeah. So, so it's, clearly, it's about close monitoring. Clearly, I suppose that is the key, isn't it, to monitor. Yes. I mean, yes. we, I, these patients because it can be quite dynamic, um, right. and they that's will right. need to be monitored quite closely. So, last that's question, right. uh, Shamila, sure. um, the hypothyroidism. I mean, do, does 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 that recover as well, or is yeah. that permanent, or? So most of the time, what was what was seen in that small group of patients who had hypothyroidism, most of them actually remain permanent. Because if you remember, hypothyroidism is destruction of the gland, right? So you can't, once the gland is destroyed, you can't, you can't, you know, the, the gland can't relive. Lah. So a majority of the patients actually, especially if it's primary hypothyroidism, that means, that means that the, the destruction is at the level of thyroid gland. It is usually permanent, okay? However, if it's secondary hypothyroidism to the pituitary gland, they did see some recovery there. Thank you very much, Shamila, and thank you everyone uh, for the questions as well. As, as you mentioned clearly, Shamila, I think we really need to watch this space of yes, yes. Um, COVID-19 and the thyroid gland, uh, and, I, and even other endocrine organs as well. I mean, the That's pituitary, right. even the gonads. Uh, yeah, so, it's the awful virus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks uh, very Shamila. much, yeah. And thank you yeah. very much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and have, uh, wish you all a very good day ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Faculty of Medicine. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.